share screen. All right, can everyone see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We're in lesson 27 on the study of the flood. We start back here in, in August, and uh, this is August of 2021. And we've been looking at the Fox flood model, and we saw that the antediluvian that's living before the flood sea level was much lower than the present level. That's my hypothesis. And we'll show evidence for this claim. And that the sea level then has risen considerably since the flood. And we'll show why it occurred as we develop this. The 40 days of rain from the waters above the firmament raised the sea level considerably. Uh, what, we're, what I'm claiming is that it had enough rainfall to raise the sea level a considerable amount. But there are other sources of water as well. We'll show this. The influx of cosmic ice. And the claim, I'm claiming that there was cosmic ice that came in from the planet with rings that caused the flood. The planet that God used to bring about the flood brought a tidal flood but it also a large amount of water vapor in the atmosphere enough to raise the barometric pressure about two to two and a half, maybe even three times what it is now. We showed evidence for that barometric pressure being higher. Now that being the case, the water, the water vapor that was in the air was then as the cold ice went through the atmosphere, it caused it to rain. There are three things that will cause rain, and these three together will cause rain. A lowering of temperature, uh, and then, of course, there needs to be enough humidity in the air as well, then the lowering of barometric pressure. All of these together will cause it to rain. And so what these, this combination of things, once the ice created the cold, which caused it to rain, then that lowers the barometric pressure, which continues to trigger it as more ice comes through the atmosphere. And all of this together then would pull a vast amount of water out of the atmosphere and a water vapor canopy above the earth. Now this would lower the barometric pressure, but it would pull a lot of, a lot of water out of the air and deposit it upon the surface of the earth. And so, the ice rings that we saw that we've developed earlier in the earlier part of this discussion, they caused the rainfall to occur. Now we looked at fl flood uh, in our flood model. We looked at submarine canyons in the earlier lesson. They were cut when the planet that caused the flood pulled large amounts of the oceans over the continents. Again, I believe the flood was largely tidal. The 40 days of rain were no doubt caused by the water vapor canopy being dissipated by the ice. But then uh, the rainfall pretty well stopped at that point. That would be at least large amounts of rain. There may have been some rain, but it wasn't large amounts like it was originally. And this water pulled out of the oceans by the planetary action, tidal action, pulled the water over the continents causing the continental shelves to be above sea level during the tidal action. That would raise them up, and of course that would cause fractures in the crust of the earth. As the waters ran off the continents, they cut these canyons, these undersea canyons that we've seen and we saw in the last lesson or two. Parts of the continental shelves were above sea level after the flood before the ice melted. So there was an ice that had been deposited, particularly in the polar regions, and it began to melt. It is still melting today. And the ice melted and it cut canyons as it, it, it eroded the land as the water that had run off and melt ice, ice melt, melted glacier. Here is what the 
scientists think and they claim that the sea level was, and of course they have this three million years ago. Uh, they their time is wrong, but their their point here is correct. I believe it's definitely correct. And we're going to show this, and I'll use my mouse to show it. What they found here and down 150, 200 feet under the water, they have found archaeological sites where people were living. Humans lived in this region and left archaeological evidence uh, 100, 150, 200 feet below the water level, the present level. And so, and this is all along your coast that you find this throughout the world. And here is where, of course, Florida was a lot bigger than it is now. Here's the state of Florida because the water level was lower. 120 meters deep, the cold climate. That's what they claim the last occurred in the last ice age. Of course, I don't believe their ice age theories are correct. Uh, they're looking at the uniformitarian geology and not at, the, at a flood that was caused by ice and planetary action uh, what we would call tidal action okay now the post-glacial sea level rise this is one of their claims this is uh, 20,000 years ago that's very short time in their title in their views and so this is all of the level the present level is up here and it was uh, these are meters it was like 120 or so meters. Now, a meter is a little over three feet. So what you get is 120 times three would be 360 feet. It's pretty close to 400 feet at this point right here. And here's the lower boundary. Now, this is the claim. This is out of a, out of a uh, website. It's, uh, of course, uh, endorsed by basically by atheists, okay? Any questions or comments? We have the Cordillian ice sheet in North America. There's Canada and the state of Montana. This is the United States, the yellow is. Here's Puget Lobe. And this ice went, came down as far down as this uh, middle of Washington state and into Montana and Idaho. And uh, so the ice again be began to melt. We have some other things that occurred as a result of this. Now, what we have here, the Cordillian ice sheet, here it is. These are the channel scab lands. Now, the Pacific Northwest and the Missoula floods, the Missoula, Montana floods. What they found is there was a great glacial lake in this region. I'll move my mouse around. You can see what I'm talking about here in this region. And of course, the ice uh, glaciers formed an ice dam, and the glaciers, as they melted, formed a huge lake near Missoula, Montana. And uh, there's a lot of evidence of this. Now, these ice dams, as they melted, they would break, and large flows of water would come out rushing through, and they formed what are called the scablands. They just took the soil down to the bedrock. Basically, it's what it is. It almost won't grow anything. And then this water that ran down through here went down through and cut the Columbia River channel deeper. So we have that occurring. There's also one up here in the Cascade Range and this ice here as well. Uh, so the, the flood, the flood waters went way over into here and then back down. So it filled up this valley and then went back. And this, even the atheists agree with this, okay? But these are some of your Cordelia, and there's two ice sheets. I think there was, uh, there were three, or maybe four passes, I think three, three and a half passes, actually, of the planet around the Earth. And these ice sheets were laid at different times uh, as the planet passed around the Earth. Now, these are latitudes, uh, and we have 49 degrees latitude. That'd be 49 degrees away from the equator. 45 degrees here. This is the boundary of Canada and the United States right here, okay? Now, if we look further on this, we can see here, here is your Laurentine ice sheet over here and the Cordelian ice sheet here. I think this one probably was a little earlier than the other one, 
this ice sheet is one the early past. Now, by earlier, I don't mean thousands of years. I mean just a few, uh, like 10 or 20 days difference in the deposition of them. What we have here, it was an ice-free region right in through here. And of course, we've already shown that there was the uh, Bear Beringia, that's the Bering Strait from Alaska up here to Russia, Russia is over on the left where my mouse is moving right now. And so this was an ice-free corridor through which animals could pass. They could graze and find, uh, find something to forage and eat as they moved down through here. And I believe, of course, God's providence allowed that to occur. So we have ice over here, Laurentine ice sheet, and then the Cordelian ice sheet here. And uh, that's supposed to be the last glacial period, according to the atheists. I think they're probably right about being the last one. This was one of the earlier passes of the planet around the Earth, and this is a lot, probably the last pass. A lot of the uh, ice rings had been uh, depleted by this time. I, now, this, this ice came way down here, the Laurentine ice sheet did. Here's your Great Lakes, and there's Lake Superior was, was covered with ice at one time. Questions or comments? Right. Now, here is Southeast Asia. This is, again, this is off a website, and the atheists uh, claim this is true. Here's Ho Chi Minh City. This is in uh, Vietnam. And uh, what we have here, this uh, up here, I believe is Formosa or Taiwan, and here's China up here. And so this is the where the water line was for the land. In other words, this whole region now, which is covered with water now, was once dry land uh, during this time. And so before the, they, they claim that it became dry land after a, an ice age occurred. Of course, uh, uh, they're using uh, the uh, wrong view of geology, uh, uniformitarian geology. And here's Rangoon, Burma, and Bangkok, Thailand. Okay. Now, over here is England. Here is Oslo, Norway, and Copenhagen, Rotterdam, Paris, London, this whole region was once dry land. And again, the atheists agree with this. This is called Dogger land. And uh, so this, this was all joined. And the uh, European continent, England, was joined to the continent at that time. Here's a picture of what they call Dogger land, another view of it. And this dark spot is England, and this is Ireland. <coughs> England and Ireland. And then here's the uh, North Sea up in this region. And this is the, the re region between England and France now, but it, uh, Doggerland was dry land at one time. That's what they're claiming up here. This would, uh, of course, I believe up here would be Iceland. Any questions or comments? All right, this is information. You, you can do a search on this and find all kinds of information. And again, they found archaeological evidence that people lived in this region right in here. So they can't date this back too far because they have humans evolving two or three million years ago, so they can't date it earlier than that. So they have to date it later by their by their views. Uh, roughly 10,000 years ago, this was dry land, and this is called logger land. And here's the United Kingdom, and then it went across here. And so it was dry land even before that as well. Here's Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and England, the United Kingdom, and this would be uh, Scotland and the north, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, and France, and of course Doggerland. And they they found archaeological evidence for it. That's very interesting. Again, you can research this even more, but this will fit my flood model quite well. Questions or comments? Now, what about the timing of the flood? What we have is the uh, the Earth circles the the star we call sun, the sun, and it's a star, and the Earth is tilted about 21 to 23 degrees on its axis. 
to what we have with June the 21st in the northern hemisphere is the longest uh, day of sunlight, the most sunlight that we have in the northern hemisphere. And uh, in uh, in December the 21st we have, and let me get this here, this is 23.5 degree tilt on the axis. Now in the, in the fall, in the December 23rd, but we'd call it winter, this would be the time that the southern hemisphere would get the most light, get the most sunlight. That's Australia and South America and places like that, south of the equator, southern hemisphere. And uh, now here's another point I wish to make. We have the equinox, that's, that's where it's equal at these points here, these times. But uh, I'm not interested in that so much as I am the the uh, tilt of the orbits of the Earth around the sun. Now then, the Earth's orbit is at its maximum distance from the sun about July the 4th, roughly. It varies a little bit back and forth a few days, roughly July the 4th, the independent state for the United States. And roughly six months later, in, these, in January, about the 5th or 6th, it's the closest to the sun that it can be. And the reason we don't have, we, uh, we don't uh, get hot in that region is because the Earth is tilted away, the tilt of the Earth axis on its axis. So we're not getting a lot of sunlight, but we are closer. Okay. Now, any questions or comments about this? Here's model Antarctica ice sheet, what it looks like. And, and there's evidence that there was living organisms in Antarctica that were covered up with ice now. You're finding trees and other stuff there, fossils of all sorts, right? Now, the last glacial vegetation map, we won't be looking at it too much, but this is the kind of vegetation, I think. Northern Africa, the Sahara Desert, had a lot of moisture in it at one time. And, and so the climate has changed there in Australia apparently as well. So again, we won't look at this. This is National Geographic Data Center. And of course, you can view this and do research on it yourself. We are not going to go into it any further. But this is their claim. And I, I believe the climate has been changing ever since the flood. Uh, whether men are accelerating or not is another question. But uh, I would I would argue that it's been changing. I think there's plenty of evidence to that. They, they've admitted it with this evidence I've given you here. Here is uh, Europe, and this will be Europe. And there's the Volga River. And uh, when I went to Russia, I was on the Volga River. I've been here in the winter uh, preaching the gospel for about three weeks, three or four weeks in 1993-94. And uh, at Yaroslav, about 250 miles north of Moscow. But here was an ice uh, sheet here in this region. Now, this ice would block the Volga River from dumping its water into the, into the ocean. That would form lakes for us here. This is your last gl glacial maximum, LGM, about 20 K. K is a thousand, and A would be annum. So it'll be 20,000 years ago is what they're claiming this occurred. Okay. Now, atheists explain this as snow falling over millions or at least thousands of years gradually to build up the ice caps. Right. Uh, uh, this is not in accordance with both the facts and the laws of nature. It just won't work. We'll show why it won't work. The evidence is that the ice came both suddenly and was extremely cold. We'll show evidence of that, and we'll show uh, that it doesn't fit the, the facts of physics as well. Uh, Apgood, and Apgood's book, I have I bought a copy of it. Uh, I read it, and then I just ordered one for myself. And uh, Apgood's book is endorsed. The preface or the, the foreword is written by none other than Albert Einstein. And Albert had many good things to say about the book and about Hapgood himself. So he's not just a uh, not so, not just a fly by night boy, not just no country boy like me. Baron Edward Toll, the explorer, 
and reported finding a fallen 90 foot fruit tree with ripe fruit and green leaves still on its branches in the frozen, frozen ground of the North Siberian Islands. Have good reports. This is uh, sufficient evidence. There's plenty of evidence that this has occurred. Other sources can be cited and are cited, have good sites, other sources as well. If the snow came slowly and, and it began to freeze, the leaves and the fruit would drop off the tree. That just would not, it had to come suddenly. And this tree then, these, uh, these trees with uh, fruit and green leaves on the frozen ground and a fallen tree now fell down, but it's the fruit and leaves are still on the, on the limbs. And the fruit would have dropped off if it had a cold spell. The fruit and leaves would drop off in just a day or two, just a few days on a big cold spell. So that won't fit. It had to be sudden. Tomakov uh, wrote on an island in New Siberia, Hedenstrom discovered, and this is Hedenstrom as a, as a man that he cites, discovered immense accumulation of buried trees and referring to them, called them bluffs on the shore, the wooden hills. He could refer to them as the wooden hills because there's a large number of trees there. And, uh, and plants of the wooden hills have been found to be Miocene age. Of course, that's one of their uh, ages that they have for their ge uh, geology and, and uh, the time of uh, various plants and animals. We don't worry about that. We can go back and study that on your own some more. The ecology of the tundra is so fragile that hundreds and th of, or, th or thousands of elephants would destroy the plant life. Now, we got a problem here with the, with the woolly mammoths. Uh, they claimed the woolly mammoths were hairy and that they could handle that real cold weather, but I say they couldn't. Elephants eat about 500 pounds or 225 kilograms of food every day to survive. Now, where in the world are thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of woolly mammoths going to find that much forage each day in the tundra? How are they going to find that much? Just tell me. And uh, the tundra saw this. The tundra plant life is very fragile. It's very interesting. Some of your tundra plants will sprout one year. The next year they'll put on blooms. The next year they'll put on seed. They go three or four, sometimes five years before they cycle. And uh, that's very interesting. They don't they don't do like plants that, uh, here in North America, like in the middle part of the United States do. But uh, so they actually cycle differently. And those plants are very fragile. And it takes them years to reproduce again because tundra is just cold and it's just real hard for them to reproduce. Elephants, if you study this and I did, are not tolerant of cold weather. Elephants in zoos must be kept indoors during the winter or they're going to die. Isn't that interesting? They just can't tolerate cold weather. Now, they would claim that the Mammoths were a variety of elephants that could. Now that's their, could be their escape. <clears throat> but they've been trying to clone uh, some of the uh, elephants and even to get some semen from frozen mammoths and uh, use artificial insemination to come up with some more woolly mammoths. I predict if they do it, they're going to find out they can't handle cold weather. That's my prediction because we don't have any elephants that can handle cold weather, real cold weather. It's an utterly absurd to even think of large numbers of elephants living in places where it get as cold as northern Canada because of the lack of food, just not an adequate food supply. And you're looking at five, 600 pounds of forage that they have to eat every day just to survive. And they take large amounts of water every day. And they drink a lot of water. And of course, in tundra, they don't have that. They don't have that. It's frozen. And they don't have the forage. They just can't survive in the tundra. Cannot do it. Uh, the people that claim they do just really haven't looked at elephants themselves. Of course, they would postulate that these are a different variety of elements, elephants. But they still got to have a lot of forage to keep their bodies warm and to continue to live. 
and they might probably have to have more than five, 600 pounds because they would just have to use that to develop body heat just to survive in that cold climate. Don't think that they, that they were in a cold climate. They were frozen there. Even with large amounts of hair, elephants cannot survive extremely cold tundra weather. That's my claim. The Arctic wasteland is a burial ground for thousands or hundreds of thousands of mammoths. And this is Hapgood tells us. A hairy species of elephant now extinct that seemed to have died and been quickly deep frozen some in midsummer. Now, notice he says they were frozen in the middle of summer. The remains of mammoths are incredibly numerous in Siberia, and strangely enough, their numbers increased further north toward the Arctic Ocean. Very interesting. That's what Hapgood says on page 71. Now, Hapgood wrote two books. I have both of them. Okay. Of citing both. Siberia, uh, this is National Geographic magazine, January 1992, page 148. Siberia's freezer may hold more than 600,000 tons of ivory. That's just ivory. That's just the tusk of these big tuskers, according to Ed Espinosa of the National Fish and Wildlife Forensic Laboratory. Now, if you figure that out, that's a bunch of elephants, a bunch of mammoths. And they, they've been harvesting that and selling it for centuries. There's been a thriving ivory, ivory trade from Siberia for thousands of years, selling ivory from, from the uh, Woolly Mammoth's ivory. And it's been old. Now, Habgood also reports this a complete mammoth body was found near Siberia's Beresvoka River. This animal had apparently frozen to death very suddenly in the middle of the summer. His stomach contents were so well preserved that the plants he had been eating could be identified. They included buttercups and wild beans in full bloom, a stage they reached only in late July, early August. I'm claiming the flood started in late July, early August. That's when it started. Now, here's the problem. We have other problems with this. This is the wrong time of the year for them to be frozen and die that way. The plant remains in the stomach of the Beresvoka mammoth. This is Dilla. It indicates that the animal died in late July or early August. Now, this is Dilla's claim. I believe both of these making the same claim. I believe they're both correct. Dilla is a theist. Now, he believes in God. But I thought it would be good to quote him. Dilla advocates a different flood model, the Whitcomb Morris model. But he agrees with my time frame. So. And uh, we have the same time frame. Late uh, July, early August. <clears throat> the hair of this mammoth, according to Tom Tomakov, uh, has been distinguished by a great variety of color of different parts of the body, as well as by the length of the hair. And as an indication that the animal had perished late in summer. Again, Tomakov says when the animal perished late in summertime. So again, we have another claim it was late in summer. The flood should have begun in July or early August. Uh, and I'm going to show this for my model. When the Earth was at aphelion, now, aphelion, this is from two Greek words, apo and helios, uh, helion, uh, derived from it is the sun. <coughs> aphelion is the time when the Earth is the furthest from the sun that it is any time of the year. That's aphelion. It's in the toward the middle of, Ju of July, about around the 4th of July or somewhere thereabouts. It r goes back and forth a little bit, but it's uh, approximately the 4th of July. That would be aphelion. Flood must have ended before January the 4th when the Earth was at perihelion. And I'll show why that's the case. My model would postulate that it had to. Well, that would be half a year. And we'll show that time frame okay, in just a moment. If the planet did not escape the Earth's gravitational before, before perihelion, before it's closest to the sun, it would be captured as a satellite or a moon. Here's why. If the sun didn't pull it away before it reached per perihelion, as it, the Earth moved further away, the sun would have a lesser effect upon it because of distance greater distance, the sun would have less pull upon it, and the Earth would have a greater uh, greater pull, 
relative speaking, because of distance. And so it would be captured as a satellite for the Earth. So it had to have been pulled uh, at Aphelion, and, uh, and it had to have been pulled away before Perihelion. Okay. Any comments or questions? That's about a half a year. Now, my claim is that Aphelion, the flood begins, that's the furthest distance from the sun, and that's around July the 4th. And, and it had to have ended <coughs> before Perihelion, which would be a, roughly half a year. And so we have about 182 days or somewhere thereabouts. So it had to have been pulled away by this time. The sun's closest at Perihelion, and so the sun will have its greatest effect upon it. I also postulate that it had some help, a little bit of help, not a great amount, but some help from Venus as well, the planet Venus. Okay. Any questions? How were the animals quick frozen? As it was in the middle of, of this warming trend in Siberia, when the climate was warmer than it, than it is now, it's Tomakov now, and right in the middle of summer, <coughs> the mammoth died, and his body was immediately frozen. Now watch this, it was immediately frozen. And somehow or other, it remained frozen all through the period of about 30,000 years, according to Hapgood. Of course, Hapgood's taken the atheistic long age period, and he's taken that old Earth view. Uh, I don't know, Hapgood may have been an atheist. I don't, I don't know whether he was a theist at all or not. But it really doesn't matter. He's, he's got some good sources for his information. I want to ask you this question. This mammoth died. His body was immediately frozen right in the middle of summer. How did that happen? Right? Had it remained frozen all throughout this, this period of time, after it was frozen until now, and of course they claim 30,000 years. That's a good question. The computer modelers, now this is a source, uh, the computer modelers, now if you really will look at things, a lot of stuff is modeled from computers. And whatever you put into your computer program, you can make it fit whatever you want to. What you want it, what you want to come out. Now, all you got to do is just take the right data and massage it a little bit, and you can get what you want out of it. <coughs> if you're prone to to do that, but the computer modelers, though, though, may start to take an interest. They have found it hard to get their models to keep the tropical climate warm under ice age conditions, so they have this these ice ages they say but they can't with their models with the computer models they can't keep it warm enough in the tropical regions for the tropical plants to survive uh, that's very interesting <laughs> some such as david ryan of the goddard institute of space science has taken issue with climate app in public on the basis that their model simply will not produce such a climate in other words their models just won't do it even when offered copious, that's a large amount of inducements to do so. In other words, you fudge it out and move it around a bit. Still won't work. Now, that's the claim. And so I find that very interesting. How did the ice caps form without destroying the tropical plants and animals? That's a good question. Why didn't they die out? Right. Assertion that the mammoth and woolly rhinoceros were trapped in mud, neglects the fact that the permafrost or the tundra only melts for a few inches. Uh, one inch is about two and a half centimeters, 2.54, on the top of the permafrost during the summer. So this wasn't permafrost, it wasn't tundra. If they sunk down deep in the mud. You know, I don't believe that that will fit the model. Tomakoff also said Brandt was very much impressed by the fact that remnants of the mammoth carcasses and skeletons and the like sometimes were found in poses, which indicated the animals were perished standing upright. So these animals perished in an upright position. Isn't that interesting? I find that very interesting. Now, if they were covered with large amounts of ice, uh, real, real cold, small particles of ice, like snow particles or sleet, 
it was super cold. Uh, they could have perished standing up and the ice could have supported them. If large amounts of ice rained in upon them. And the ice would, would come in and would have frozen the, <coughs> the water vapor. So we'd have large amounts of uh, ice particles like uh, sleet or uh, even hail, things like that. Okay. Because they were standing upright, they assumed they sank in the mud. Uh, they could have been buried in cosmic ice, super cold ice. Cosmic ice would be near absolute zero, something like 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit or even colder than that. So that would be, uh, would certainly freeze them very quickly. <clears throat> now, Tomakov also tells us Everywhere carcasses of the mammoth and rhinoceros are found, they have been buried within this frozen ground of tundra near its upper surface and used them to fairly elevated points on the top of bluffs. They're on the top of hills. Interesting enough. It has long been and more in elevations situated near higher hills than along the low coast on the flat tundra. Often mammoth localities are on the highest points on the tundra. Now, wait a second. If they were trying to escape rising waters, this would fit. These mammoths then tried to go up to high ground to get away from the water, and then the ice came in and froze them in the, in the, high, in the higher hills where they were located. That's where they're finding them. And so this is very interesting when we look at it. Rainfall began, and shortly thereafter, after the mammoths had time to move to higher ground, the ice began to fall. And it is the contention of this author of me that this is probably what occurred because of the fact that skeletons of reptiles and amphibians are found in northern Russia. We'll see this on our next slide. And amphibians and reptiles just don't live in cold climates like the tundra. You don't find them there. They're cold blooded, they can't handle that temperature. <clears throat> on the shore of the river Shivoharia, the Duana, where a number of perfectly preserved skeletons of Permian reptiles and amphibians were found within the bed of an ancient river, filled up completely with drift. All the skeletons were found uh, enclosed in peculiar concretions, in most cases reproducing fairly well the general shape of the animal. They were oriented at the locality all in the same way, undoubtedly according to the direction of the flow, the flow of water. So they're all oriented according to the flow of water. And then they were buried and covered up and, and was fossilized at that time. Very interesting. So there was there was a flow of water, a flow of something. The tundra gets far too cold for the reptiles or amphibians to survive. They just can't survive in that cold climate. You don't find reptiles or amphibians in the tundra today. Clearly, the climate was different during that time than it is now. That's obvious. So it was different. The subtropical climate that has already been documented in this region fits the Fox flood model, but it does not fit any atheistic model. This won't fit it. As we've laid out. The strata, Tomakov tells us, in which are buried the bones and carcasses of mammoths, rhinoceros, and other extinct animals. And remnants of plants are re represented by sandy clay, long which said it was a different thickness. Marine shells, marine mi mammals have never been discovered in it. These sediments may be only of freshwater or terrestrial origin. So there's no marine mammals in this. Now, <clears throat> my claim is that the earth was destroyed with water, as the Bible tells us, but not necessarily all with liquid water. The polar regions were covered with frozen water, and that was the destruction with water, as the Bible says. And uh, then the flood, the water, the liquid water, uh, covered the other regions. That's why there are no marine mammals here, because it was covered with ice. And the waters from the oceans didn't reach it, they didn't bring the marine mammals and marine plants into the marine shells or, or plants or animal mammals into it, into the sediment. Comments or questions? <clears throat> Whatever caused the extinction of the mammoths also caused the extinction of the woolly rhinoceros, the giant beaver, and several other animals. 
large beavers and, and discovered their fossils. We want to be a rhinoceros as well. All these animals died, according to Tomakov, out of more or less simultaneous and probably from the same cause. So he says all of these animals were fossilized at the same time, probably from the same cause. And I would agree with him, probably from the same cause. <clears throat> These animals did not die from starvation. I'll tell you why. Tomakov tells us in no case was it possible to discover in the frozen carcass of the mammoth any bad effects or conditions under which the animal used to live. In other words, the animals were not mal malnourished. Animals were always well fed and fat, sometimes too fat. <laughs> they had they were well fed. So again, they didn't die from starvation. And there's no apparent evidence that they died because they were ill. We'll show that in a minute. Uh, Tapgood talks about one of the one of the fossils. He did not fall into water because, as was ascertained by another investigator, large masses of his blood were found under him. Blood would, of course, have been washed away had the, they tumbled into a river. So again, Hapgood argues that this didn't happen that way. So he didn't drown. Remember, they were usually found on the tops of high places. Anyhow, that's where they're usually found, fitting the flood model quite well. The deposition of ice caps by snowfall requires large amounts of precipitation. Now, the claim is that the ice, that the snow raining down, raised the ice caps. The problem for the atheist is that the precipitation requires that the air temperature in, increase rather than decrease as it would during an ice age. The colder the air, the less moisture the air has in it, because there are three factors that determine rainfall, barometric pressure, the amount of moisture in the air, and the temperature. The lower the temperature is, the less moisture can be held in the air, the moisture comes out of the air. The air in the Arctic region is very dry, and you can see this if you live in the United States in the wintertime, the humidity is low. You don't have a high humidity at all because the cold air keeps it from getting high. It gets below the below the dew point. It'll, <coughs> it'll come out. The water will come out. The moisture come out of the air. The amount of H two O that's water that air can hold is a function of the temperature and pressure. It's called partial pressure. We have a chart on that right here. So you can see here the amount of saturation, water saturation that can hold saturation factor of water in air at sea level. And of course, your barometric pressure affects it as well as temperature and then the amount of humidity that's in it. And so the colder it gets, the less that it can hold, the less saturation, the less moisture it can hold in the air. It just comes down as it gets colder and colder. Some places in the Siberia get more than 60 below zero. It got 40 to 50 below zero where I was in 93, 94 in, in Yaroslav, Russia. Any questions? I was there in December and January. Okay. A widely accepted assumption with which contemporary geologists approach the question of the ice age is that the latter occurs as a result of the lowering of the average temperature of the whole surface of the Earth at the same time. Now, Tomakov, Hapgood here tells us, it's a remarkable that this assumption has been maintained over a long period of time, despite the fact that it is in sharp conflict with the basic principles of physics in the field of meteorology. <laughs> the colder it gets, the less moisture, you, less rainfall you have, Hapgood says. It's very interesting. And of course, remember, uh, Albert Einstein endorsed his book. It's, you can read the, his endorsement of it. Hapgood went ahead and says the basic conflict was brought to the attention of science at least 70 years ago. It has never been resolved. They just ignore it because it, it, it destroys their, their narrative. It won't fit their narrative. Now meteorologists point out that if precipitation is to be increased, there has to be a greater supply of moisture in the air. Well, that's obvious. <laughs> The only possible way of increasing the amount of moisture in the air is to raise temperature there. Captain Good tells us. Uh, interesting. 
on pages 49 and 50, he goes on to say, it would seem, therefore, that to get an ice age, one would have to raise rather than lower the average temperature. This essential fact of physics was pointed out a long time ago as 1892 by Sir Richard Robert Bell. Sir Robert Ball, I'm sorry. Would have good pages 49 and 50. And he cites uh, Robert Ball. So they've known about this for more than 100 years, and they're just ignoring the evidence because they don't have another model. Remember that Albert Einstein endorsed the book written by Hapgood in the preface. They've already laid it out. Pat <clears throat> Hollingsworth tells us that cold climates are arid, that is, they're very dry. As to scale increasing knowledge of phases of severe problem permafrost, both within and beyond the glaciated regions gives in the case of extremely cold phases, which in the absence of substantial accumulation of snow and ice must be considered as dry phases. They are therefore fit in with the concept of increased precipitation as the dominant cause of the onset of glaciation. <laughs> it's backwards. They had to have higher temperature to get the moisture and they can't get the ice without having a lower temperature. It just won't work. The whole system is flawed. Again, they just ignore the evidence. <clears throat> the first major problem is the absence of a large amount of sedimentary rock in some parts of the polar regions. Now, some flood advocates, now we're going to look at what some people who believe in the flood, but they don't take the model that I'm postulating. They have another model, another flood model. And uh, their first major problem with that of the flood model that is postulated is that the problem with the absence of large amounts of sedimentary rock in some parts of the polar region. Some parts of the polar region don't have any sedimentary rock. And there's almost none. And so the flood did not cover that region. I'm not saying there's a local flood, I'm saying the ice covered it. So there was destruction by water, as the Bible says, but it wasn't flood water, it was ice. It wasn't liquid water, it was solid water. The second major problem is the extreme cold of the ice and sudden nature of the freezing. It's evidenced by the plants and animals which were quick frozen. Some of these woolly mammoths are huge. They're huge elephants. And they're frozen so that the, so quickly that the internal meat did not decompose. Now, if you take an animal that large and put him like in zero degree temperature, it'll take him uh, several weeks to freeze inside. And uh, at least several days, enough time for the decomposition to start in the inner organs. This didn't happen. Uh, canyons on the continental shelves can't be explained, and they're at least partially explained by the melting ice. And so my flood model explains those quite well. There's evidence that at least parts of the continental shelves were once dry land. Again, that's phenomenon explained by the polar ice caps, by, the, by my model of the formation of the polar ice caps. This supplies a mechanism for a land bridge from Asia and North America across the Bering Strait. Of course, we've already talked about that. Scientists call this land bridge Beringia. I believe it was there. I don't have any doubt it occurred. What appears to be the oldest well-documented human campsite in Alaska. Now, this is a motto. If not at all in North America, the artifacts from the site seem to confirm a commonly held theory that several different migratory groups cross the land bridge from Siberia to populate the Americas. And so the artifacts, human artifacts, we're talking about here, of course. Here's the region they went across. Remember the ice region had a gap between it where they could migrate across. <clears throat> so this is what I'm claiming occurred. This is map of Beringia. And of course, these dates are put there by the atheists. And uh, old Earth creationists would agree with these dates. But here's Russia, and here's Alaska, and here's the Bering Strait. Right in here, the Bering Sea right here, and the Arctic Ocean up here. There's your present day shoreline in the green area. So migration went across there. Now, here's another map of Beringia, and this was uh, before the water covered it. This was land, so the plants and the animals could have walked across here, all across here, 
the streets that would have been fairly flat. And they could have fished, caught fish, and moved along here. <clears throat> and, and or they could have come across through here as well. Yeah. post alluvial migration routes of men and animals. This is the atheist view. Remember the between the Laurentine ice sheet and the Cordelian glacier, there's a gap in, in here where there would grow plants plants so that animals could eat and then move down here and humans could go across. Uh, claim is that some on boats, ships, went, migrated clear down to here as well. Maybe went across here as well in boats. And there was this migration across here from Europe and Africa, probably this would be Europe, Spain right in here, and Portugal right here, where my mouse is. Any questions? These are archaeological sites, the Clovis and the Channel Islands and so forth. There's Hawaii over here. These are other archaeological sites that they've discovered. Fairbanks, and that's not Fairbanks, Alaska, but my man in Fairbanks. 1989 claims the North Atlantic Ocean level was about 130 meters, <coughs> which would be a 426.5 feet, or roughly 427 feet, or lower during the ice age than it is at present. That's a bunch. That's nearly, nearly 400, over 400 feet. That's pretty, pretty big, big distance. Now Fairbanks goes ahead and gives more information. The Caribbean. Uh, reef crest coral, Acropora polenta, uh, limerick, is the best available sea level indicator for Pleistocene, Pleistocene studies. <clears throat> this species is generally restricted to the upper five meters of water. Of course, this is the British spelling of the word meter. Water dominates the reef crest community in many locations. And uh, this should be dot, dot, dot. That's a mistake on my part here. This is an ellipsis mark. Extrapolation of the sea level curve to 1800 years BP before present. Okay. Now, BP usually is back from 1950 because they began to, they started dating things back prior to that. Why? Because there were a lot of atomic bomb tests and the nuclear, the radiocarbon, other datings were messed up by the uh, atomic bombs that were tested hydrogen bombs. So they go back from about 1950. That's BP. Indicates the sea level of 121 plus or minus five meters below the present level. Now again, that's pretty close to the figure we had earlier, over 400 feet. During the last glacial maximum, the best estimate so far, according to Fairbanks, 121 multiply that by about 3.28 feet per meter. So 121 times 3.28. I'll do the math right quick. That's roughly 400 feet, approximately. Any questions? At its height, Allegra and Snyder wrote, 20,000 years ago, and they got the same time frame. Ice sheets of mile thick covered much of northern Europe and North America. Glaciers expanded to high plateaus and mountains throughout the world. Enough ice was locked up in land to cause sea levels to drop more than 100 meters. It would be 328 feet. That's what they got. But oh, where they are today. Again, they're claiming that it's risen about 300 feet since about 20, the last 20,000 years, sea level has. <clears throat> so it's been rising ever since that time. Again, Hughes says the last ice age peaked just 18,000 years ago, where they're off, they differ by 2,000. One third of the planet's land area was entombed in ice, causing sea level to drop some 500 feet. Hughes claims it was 500 feet. And so that the sea level has risen by 500 feet in the last 18,000 years. So, again, there were no humans back there with uh, SUVs causing it to occur. During ice ages, when sea level is low, according to its plenary, 
Australia, Tasmania, New, Ze New Guinea, and their smaller neighbors uh, coalesce into a single great island of Magnesia, Magnesia by a scientist. And so they, they give it a name. And so uh, New Guinea, I think, is maybe the second largest island in the, in the world, I think. Uh, Greenland is the biggest by far. But New Guinea may be the number two second largest island. I think it is, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> here again is your ice sheets. We have the gap between them right through here. We're at a most learning tide in Cordelia, the ice sheet. And here's the continental shelf that was exposed all along here. Uh, the sea of this sea right here, this uh, called the sea, uh, sea of Cortez, I think, but it's called. It was dry land at that time. And you can go quite some distance out here from Florida, almost going over here to the Yucatan Peninsula. Here's Greenland ice sheet. It's all covered with ice right here. Okay. Uh, again, these are the depths of the ice and the depths of the height of the land. Now, here is the mountain ranges along here. And of course, I believe the, the mountain ranges were elevated by the gravity of the planet as it moved down across in this motion like this down. And it caused that. And if it was going across in a straight manner, as the Earth turned and it rotated, then it would appear to go at an angle because of the rotation of the Earth. Okay. That's why it would go at an angle. Again, we had this Southeast Asia before the ice melted. That's what it looked like. Again, there's Taiwan or Formosa. And this is Ho Chi Minh City, it used to be Saigon. And uh, here's Bangkok, Thailand, or Rangoon. I think that used to be Burma, but they've got a new name for them now, and another name. Here's uh, probably in, uh, Malaysia right in here. <coughs> And we showed this Europe before the ice melted. We've shown this already. And this is Doggerland. This is what it looked like during this period of time. It was dry land in here. People lived on it. They've been found archaeological evidence that they did. We're going to stop here with this. We'll come back to this a little bit later. All right. We'll stop right here with, with this. Are there any questions? No one has.